Hi, and welcome to episode 20 of Let's Talk Bitcoin, a twice weekly show exploring the ideas, people, and projects building the new digital economy and the future of money. 20 episodes. That number came up fast. Today is an experiment. One of the most common complaints we get is that our show is too long, and some listeners would rather have the ability to pick and choose what order they listen to the show in. It's also very intimidating for new users who might be interested in a particular segment, but not in the half hour of discussion that came before. Episode 20 will be released in a number of parts. You should find a total of four files. In 20.1, Stephanie and Andrea share their experiences with LocalBitcoins.com, an alternative to centralized exchanges that's not against the rules yet. In 20.2, the hosts have a long conversation about what the point of mining is and if the incentive might have become the end result, losing sight of Satoshi's vision. This is a must-listen-to segment and clocks in a little under a half hour. In 20.3, I sit down with Asher Tan and Ryan Joe, better known as Zhao Tong, two of the founders behind Coinjar.io, a new Australian Bitcoin exchange. At the end of this segment, you can hear Andreas on Bloomberg West yesterday. In 20.4, Andreas tells us about the upcoming Bitcoin Improvement Project proposal number 32, and that's what you're listening to now, which proposes a new third type of wallet, a hierarchical, deterministic wallet. Sounds technical, and it is, but the concept is powerful, and it's worth your time to understand the potential here. We appreciate you hanging with us as we try these new things out. Please send all your feedback to adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. Enjoy hierarchical, deterministic wallets, the seed that becomes the mighty oak, from the team at letstalkbitcoin.com. I'm very interested in a new standard called hierarchical, deterministic wallets, defined in Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 32. So BIP32 is a standard for creating wallets in a tree structure that can be derived from a root key. This is based on an original conversation and suggestion by Greg Maxwell, who's one of the core developers, who is really a genius with cryptography and has these incredibly innovative ideas around key management. Peter Woolley developed that into a full proposal, and it's also been implemented by Tomas Bloomer in the Bits of Proof implementation of the Bitcoin Enterprise Server, as well as many other places. I'm currently writing an implementation based around that. I'd like to talk a bit about the topic. So, so what are hierarchical deterministic wallets? Type 1 wallets, uh, as we know them today, are wallets where the private key is derived from a random number. They allow you to generate a completely new um, private-public key pair whenever you want. The problem with that is that you have to back up each wallet individually because there's no way to recreate that private key. It's based on a random number. Type 2 wallets are the type we see in the original implementation in Electrum, where you have a seed And that seed generates not just the first wallet, but wallets after that in a sequence. So essentially all the wallets that are generated derive from that original seed, and you can then regenerate them. And that works very well as a backup process. So taking that one step further, BIP32 allows you to have a type 2 wallet that actually has structure in it. So you still have a master seed, but then you can develop sub wallets to that. And for each sub wallet, you can have sub accounts and then sub wallets and sub wallets. But basically, it's a tree structure. You have at the root a master key, and then you can derive all the children underneath that. And from each of the children, you can derive more children. The nice thing about this is that you can share any part of the tree. So, for example, I could give um, one of the sub trees. I could give the private keys or public keys to someone else, and they could then generate branches further down that tree, for example, in order to do one key per transaction, or they could use it to monitor some of those keys, for example, to do accounting or transaction counting. If you have an organization, it would allow you to do departmental spending, etc. So it's a very interesting protocol. What do you guys think? I was going to say, would that mean they're adopting your grandchildren or something? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So it, it really does have that kind of structure. You can think of the master key as the ancestor. And then you can create descendants. And then you can essentially assign different families of keys for different uses. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the uses for like business accounting. I mean, that sounds super useful to me. And it's great to have the more concrete idea of like what this could be used for. But I imagine there's lots of other uses besides just in business. Could even be used to manage like a household budget or something like that. 
This is not just for business and you don't need a hierarchical structure. Let me give you one specific example. Let's say you have a web server that's doing content monetization and you want to be able to generate lots and lots and lots of keys, uh, essentially one per transaction or one per page. Just like you can do that with a master public key in Electrum, in a hierarchical deterministic wallet, what you can do is take a branch, share the public key that's the head of that branch, and then from that derive millions, billions, 2.1 billion keys, in fact, that are all derived from that master public key. But then you can also unlock any of those wallets with a private key that never touches that server. So that way you can have essentially a completely untrusted server generating public keys without any knowledge of the underlying private key that can <laughs> unlock all those transactions. That's a great use case. Let's Talk Bitcoin is heard each week by thousands of people who are participating in the new digital economy. Our listener base of Bitcoin owners, miners, investors, technologists, and merchants is growing fast. We offer a limited number of short advertising slots in each show to keep our listeners engaged and to provide maximum impact for our sponsors. If you'd like to talk to us about Let's Talk Bitcoin, send us an email at sponsors at letstalkbitcoin.com. If I showed you a website where you could easily purchase electronics from the world's largest distributor with Bitcoins at 0% markup, would you think it was too good to be true? Good news. It's real. And it's at BitcoinStore.com. Choose from half a million items, save money over Amazon and Newegg, and convert your Bitcoins to real world items. You can even buy with privacy. All they need is a shipping address. But don't take my word for it. See for yourself at BitcoinStore.com. Another use case is you give the public key to someone who's doing audit, and they can see all of the transactions um, of all of the subtree, but they can't unlock any of them. So it gives you this enormous flexibility to share parts of a key structure and share either the public or the private side, and then derive an infinite number of sublevels or near infinite number of sublevels very, very quickly. It's, it's, uh, it has a lot of uses. I'm planning on using it, for example, for doing paper wallets that are all derived off one master key so that you can not only store them individually, but you could also recover any of the paper wallets deterministically. So how do we get one? <laughs> I want one. <laughs> So it's still a standard in development, it's draft, but here's what's interesting. In the last development announcement that Gavin did, which was the development announcement number four, where he talked about version 083, one of the things he said is that his plans include, by 09, the implementation of hierarchical deterministic wallets. I'm not sure if he's endorsing BIP32 at this point, but certainly there's enough momentum behind it. There's already three or four implementations uh, that work very, very well. And so I think this is going to be moving forward quite fast. This might be totally wrong. When you talk about the seed that then you're, you use to generate this hierarchy of wallets, basically, is there any sort of connection between that seed and the brain wallet concept? Uh, so a brain wallet is where you uh, generate a single key off a seed that's, that's uh, human memorable. So, for example, a passphrase. Theoretically... Uh, you could use a, a, a brain passphrase as the root for a hierarchical deterministic wallet. I would consider that a potential security risk because if you were able to unlock that master key, you unlock the entire tree. So that's, that's ah. a very bad thing. Uh, and brain wallets have the distinct disadvantage that they include human patterns. And if it's memorable, it's brute forcible. So I, I generally consider brain wallets to be extremely insecure other than for very uh, sophisticated users who, who can generate high entropy passphrases and, and not forget them. For the purpose of hierarchical deterministic wallets, usually you start with a random number generator and then you apply some kind of passphrase using a hard to brute force algorithm like script. That's the implementation I've seen so far. Uh, but generally, you start with a random number. What you would do is you would only need to keep a very strong backup of that master key, and then everything else from that level below could be derived algorithmically. It, it makes backup a lot easier, but it also creates more risk on that single key. So you have to balance it very carefully. 
once this makes it past the the standards process and the decision making, what type of software is needed to enable this? Is this something that will need to be built into wallets or will there need to be a specific application that is just about hierarchical deterministic addresses or what's the what do you think the process is going to be? It's probably going to be built into wallets um, and other applications. So, for example, if it's built into Bitcoin D and Bitcoin QT, then you would be able to get something very similar to what you can do with Electrum today, which is have some kind of recovery seed that you can store, and then you can recover all of your keys in the case of loss. So you could lose your entire wallet. You wouldn't need to necessarily encrypt your wallet on the device because you could you could store them as key offline, and in your wallet only have public keys. So as a result, you can derive payment keys, but you can't actually send any transactions. So there's all kinds of nice things you could do. I think you'd see it first in wallets, then you'd see it as part of online wallet infrastructure, and then finally you'd see it in more complex services. Thanks to Andreas M. Antonopoulos and Dr. Stephanie Murphy for providing content for this segment. Please send all listener mail to adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. Especially this time, because we're trying something very new here, I'd like as much feedback as possible, so chime in. Thanks for listening. <laughs>